So um, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Denis Sartko. I am a program coordinator at the Goethe Institute New York. And today I'm happy to present Fictive Witness, Monuments, Memory and the Art of Indigenous History. It is the third and final part of a series of online lecture performances created by Alex Strada and Tali Karen in 2018 during Avi Feldman's curatorial residency at Level 38. Tali Karen and Alex Strada are artists, collaborators, and educators based in New York City. In addition, Alex is a 2021 recipient of the New York Foundation for the Arts Women's Fund for Media Artists and a professor in residence at the Rhode Island School of Design. Tali's recent solo exhibition have taken place at iBeam and Ladlow 38, and her forthcoming solo show will be open, opening at the Museum of Contemporary Arts in Detroit in the spring of 2021. In case you missed the first part of the series and the second one, you can find archived versions on our website. And before handing it over to Tali and Alex, who will guide you through this event, I want to thank our speaker, Sherry Handorf, our technical support, the ASL interpreters, Catherine Muller, and my team at the Goethe Institute. And of course, all of you for coming. And now, please enjoy the lecture performance. Thank you. And thank you everyone for being here today. We're, we are very, very excited um, for this upcoming uh, lecture performance and the third one uh, in this iteration. My name is Tali Karen, and with me on the screen is Alex Strada. And uh, we are the artists and collaborators behind Fictive Witness, a lecture performance series that originated at the Goethe Institute at 2018. The series uses our film, Save the Presidents, as a point of departure. Structured over the course of a day, the film depicts a field of cracked and decaying presidential monuments and the manual labor that takes place around them. These monuments originally belonged to a theme park in Williamsburg, Virginia, which closed in 2010 in the wake of the economic collapse. We see these cracks of these monuments as fissures of opportunity to unpack oppressed American histories and to politically imagine what else might be possible. For each performance, we invite a different speaker to present a layer of narration over the film. Today, we are gathered for the last event in this iteration of the series, Monuments, Memory, and the Art of Indigenous History, which is a collaboration with Native Studies scholar, Sherry Hundorf. Uh, this lecture performance will explore how US monuments create celebratory national narratives premised on indigenous erasure and how native artists revise official histories to counter settler colonial violence and assert contemporary claims in the context of recent events, such as the Dakota Access Pipeline protests. To give you a very condensed overview of the incredible work that Sherry does, I'm going to read a brief version of her bio. And for this, we'd like to invite her to turn her camera on the screen or turn her camera on and join us on the screen rather. Hi, Sherry. Um, Sherry M. Hundorf is class of 1938 professor of Native American Studies in the Department of Ethnic Studies at UC Berkeley. She is the author of two books, Going Native, Indians in the American Cultural Imagination and Mapping the Americas, the Transnational Politics of Contemporary Native Culture, and a co-editor of three volumes, including Indigenous Women and Feminism, Politics, Activism, Culture, she won a Guggenheim Memorial Fellowship to complete her current book project, Indigeneity and the Politics of Space, Gender, Geography, Culture. And she is also writing with Ray Hundorf, a community history of indigenous land claims in Alaska. We will start today's performance with, a, with the screening of Save the Presidents, featuring a pre-recorded intervention by Sherry Hundorf. Uh, this will be followed by a collective discussion between Sherry, Alex, and myself and you, the audience, of course, which we are very excited to have to be part of this conversation. Uh, the chat would be disabled until the Q&A and then it will open up for questions. We would let you know. Um, and now we really um, are excited without further ado to turn to Save the Presidents with the Sherry's narration and intervention. In July, 2020, 
In the hours leading up to President Donald Trump's arrival at the Mount Rushmore National Monument, Native American protesters blocked the road to the site carrying signs that read, you are on stolen land and dismantle white supremacy. Trump had come to South Dakota to deliver an Independence Day address against the backdrop of the iconic faces of former presidents George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, and Theodore Roosevelt carved into the Black Hills. After a commanding military display by the Army and Air Force, Trump mounted the stage and delivered a speech praising what he called the exceptional lives and extraordinary legacies of the titans of Mount Rushmore. The Founding Fathers, said Trump, launched a revolution in the pursuit of justice, equality, liberty, and prosperity, principles that are widely understood as American national ideals. Because of their legacy, in his words, there could be no better place to celebrate America's independence than beneath this magnificent, incredible, majestic mountain and monument to the greatest Americans who have ever lived. But Trump's speech also alluded to the reasons for the protests by calling up ongoing controversies surrounding racist monuments, such as those of the Confederacy, across the United States. Angry mobs are trying to tear down statues of our founders and deface our most sacred memorials, he warned, promising that we will not allow our country and all of its values, history, and culture to be taken from us. Mount Rushmore, he assured his audience, will stand forever as an eternal tribute to our forefathers and to our freedom. If for some Mount Rushmore represents a shrine of democracy, for those native people who came to protest Trump's speech, along with many others who watched in solidarity from across the world, the images of the presidents carry altogether different meanings. The 60-foot granite faces of the presidents are carved into the Black Hills, recognized by the 1868 Treaty of Fort Laramie as part of the Great Sioux Nation. Treaties acknowledge the status of indigenous communities as independent self-governing nations and affirm rights to the land that pre-existed colonial expansion. They remain the law of the land. Nevertheless, the United States has unilaterally broken each one of the more than 370 treaties that it signed with Native nations, and the Treaty of Fort Laramie is no exception. Shortly after the treaty was signed, gold was discovered in the Black Hills, prompting U.S. military expeditions to secure the land it had guaranteed to the Sioux. The ensuing conflicts prompted one of the fiercest U.S. military assaults on tribal nations. In the decades that followed, the government asserted its power not only by military force but also by symbol. In 1927, it commissioned sculptor Gutzon Borglum, creator of the world's largest Confederate memorial at Stone Mountain, Georgia, and a member of the Ku Klux Klan, to begin construction of Mount Rushmore National Monument. Like the military campaigns to secure the Black Hills, the monument is, among other things, an assertion of U.S. power. Monuments change the meanings of their spatial locations, and the Mount Rushmore Monument conveys that the Black Hills belong to the United States rather than to Native nations. For these reasons, Mount Rushmore has long been a site of Native activism. In 1970, as the Red Power Movement gained momentum as part of broader campaigns for civil rights, Native people occupied Mount Rushmore and demanded its return to the Sioux Nation. They brought their fight to the courts, and in 1980, the U.S. Supreme Court acknowledged that the Black Hills rightfully belonged to the Sioux Nation and provided $100 million to compensate for its unlawful seizures. The Sioux refused the payment, and today the money, now over $1 billion, remains in trust. For the Native people who turned up to protest Trump's speech, Theirs was part of a long fight over the land that had lasted for more than 150 years. Yet these two meanings of Mount Rushmore, a monument to heroes of American democracy versus a site of indigenous dispossession, represent the Janus face of US history, its two sides inextricably entwined. The country is built on native land and its founding depended upon the annihilation of millions of native people who lived here prior to the arrival of Europeans. 
For the founding fathers, building the United States entailed conquering Native people and appropriating their land. George Washington, the so-called father of the nation, ordered invasions of Native communities and instructed troops to extirpate them from the country. Abraham Lincoln, emancipator of slaves, ordered the hanging of 38 Dakota men who sought to protect their lands from treaty violations, an event that remains the largest mass execution in U.S. history. When Thomas Jefferson negotiated the Louisiana Purchase, he set the stage for U.S. military campaigns and removals that devastated Native communities throughout the West. Theodore Roosevelt declared that the most ultimately righteous of all wars is a war with savages, by which he meant Native people, and he praised the massacre of Native women and children at Sand Creek as the most beneficial a deed as ever took place on the frontier. This holds true for other presidents as well, from Andrew Jackson's removal of Cherokee and other tribes along the Trail of Tears, to Ulysses S. Grant's war on Plains Indians, to Harry Truman and Dwight Eisenhower's termination policies. When Native people showed up to protest Trump's Independence Day speech with signs reading, you were on stolen land, and dismantle white supremacy, they protested not only the current president's overt racism, an ongoing violation of Native land rights. They also protested the ways that white supremacy and Native dispossession are enshrined in American history but erased from American memory. At places like Mount Rushmore, the Founding Fathers appear simply as American heroes. The silences and erasures of U.S. history are no accident. The brutal conquest and dispossession of Native people are incompatible with American ideals of freedom, equality, and democracy. For this reason, from the beginnings of the nation to the present, defining U.S. history and identity has entailed reckoning with the figure of the Indian. Such representations symbolically resolve the contradictions between violence against Native people and American ideals. When, for example, construction of the U.S. Capitol Rotunda commenced in the early 19th century, a key task was to define the new nation's history. The capital was and remains as important as symbol as it is seat of governance, as a means of representing U.S. history and the boundaries of national identity. The rotunda features eight historical paintings placed between the years of 1819 and 1955 on the themes of exploration, settlement, and the American Revolution events defined as the beginnings of the nation. Native people feature prominently in John Vanderlyn's Landing of Columbus and John Gadsby Chapman's Baptism of Pocahontas, images that depict the European discovery and settlement of the New World as a triumph of civilization over savagery. According to these visual narratives, expansion benefited European settlers and good Indians who recognized European superiority. In this schema, native resistance to dispossession appears as irredeemable savagery. According to colonial logic, savagery, the racial idea attached to native people to denote their inferiority, had no future, and so Indians would inevitably disappear in the wake of modernity. Sometimes colonial image making exhibited nostalgia for native disappearance, a stance that granted the viewer moral authority while refusing to acknowledge the brutality of conquest and its continuation in the present. Sometimes outright erasure provided the solution to the challenge native people present to American ideals. In the 19th century, in the Western landscapes that came to define U.S. national identity, Native people were nowhere to be seen, even though violent conflicts over land persisted in the region until the end of the century. The land, these images suggested, was available for the taking. History, writes Haitian historian Michel Raff Truio, is the fruit of power, but power itself is never so transparent that its analysis becomes superfluous. The ultimate mark of power may be its invisibility, the ultimate challenge, the exposition of its roots.
Power, he explains, manifests in silences and erasures as the identification of historical facts and the creation of archives and narratives hinge on the question of whose lives matter. Nowhere are the entanglements of history and power more evident than in monuments. Who holds the power and resources to distill memory into a single perspective, construct monuments, and secure locations to display them? Whose histories and perspectives are silenced in the process? Conflicts over monuments, then, are not just about how we remember the past, but also about who holds power in the present. Erasing Native people from history means that they have no place in the contemporary world and certainly hold no legitimate claims to land. When Native activists occupy spaces such as Mount Rushmore, they are calling attention to their contemporary existence in a world that refuses to see them, as they also show these places as contested lands. Native presence, in turn, exposes dominant narratives, in this case, narratives about American heroes, as at once the fruit of power and consequence of Native erasure. Along with activists, Indigenous artists have undertaken the tasks of challenging white supremacist monuments while also offering their own understandings of history that expose the violence of conquest and assert Native presence. In reshaping our understandings of the past, these artists also alter our understandings of the present, including the territorial conflicts that continue on Native lands across the Americas. When Trump spoke at Mount Rushmore in July, he did so against a social backdrop of increased scrutiny of the Founding Fathers. Just days before his Independence Day address, protesters had thrown red paint on the statue of George Washington in Washington Square Park in downtown New York City, demanding attention to his complicity in the entangled histories of dispossession and slavery that enabled the birth of the nation. Conveying the complexity of Washington's historical role is also a goal of Mohawk artist Alan Michelson. It's time to reckon with a U.S. founding father who waged genocidal warfare against indigenous nations, says Michelson. When I see statues of Washington, I see not only a founding father, but also a genocidal one. Among the Haudenosaunee, the Six Nations Confederacy that includes the Mohawk, Washington earned the name Onodagonius, or Town Destroyer, because of his treatment of Native nations during and after the Revolutionary War. In 1779, he orchestrated a military campaign that forced Haudenosaunee nations from their homelands in present-day New York State and destroyed their communities and provisions. Washington's orders to Major General John Sullivan were, the immediate objects are the total destruction and devastation of their settlements and the capture of many prisoners of every age and sex as possible. Sullivan's armies destroyed 60 towns, including homes, fields, orchards, and livestock, freeing the land for white settlement. Beyond the immediate casualties of war, hundreds of Haudenosaunee people died of starvation and exposure in the campaign's aftermath. Michelson takes this suppressed history as the subject of his 2018 video installation titled Anya Dagonius, Town Destroyer. Michelson projects images of Washington's scorched earth campaign, maps of Haudenosaunee lands, historical markers attesting to the events, and a film of fire consuming family homes onto a three-dimensional bust of Washington. A soundtrack features voices of Haudenosaunee community members speaking over and over again the name Anya Dagonius against the background of drum and rattle music. In Michelson's installation, the white bust of Washington calls up celebratory renderings of the founding father. But by projecting images of conquest onto it, Michelson brings to bear the violence enacted by Washington, violence that enabled the founding of New York State and the nation itself. At the same time, the soundtrack counters the silences and erasures of history by foregrounding the voices of contemporary Haudenosaunee people who are here granted the social authority to narrate the story of Washington 
and by extension, the story of the nation. Washington's military campaign against the Haudenosaunee commenced a process of war and dispossession that lasted for more than a century. As the nascent nation expanded its boundaries south and west, it did so by appropriating native lands. The history of westward expansion is a major subject of the art of Cree painter Kent Monkman. Monkman's paintings have recently garnered widespread public attention, not least when New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art commissioned his work for its Great Hall. But he was initially best known for his revisions of iconic landscape paintings. In the United States, landscape painting became the dominant art genre from around 1820 until 1880. This was also the period of westward expansion, marked by Indian removals, migrations along the Oregon and California trails, the California Gold Rush, and the Indian Wars on the Plains. Throughout this period, painters created images of a vast sublime frontier that became synonymous with U.S. national identity. Native people seldom appeared in these images, and when they did, they seemed continuous with the landscape, part of the wilderness to be conquered in the name of progress, so that landscapes presented a fantasy of unfettered access to the land. Monkman's landscape paintings, by contrast, represent native presence on the land, thereby challenging the notion of empty land available for appropriation and bringing to bear the violence of indigenous possession. He does this by reworking celebrated landscape paintings, including those by artists in the U.S. Hudson River School and Canada's Group of Seven. Europeans in North America, says Monkman, had stolen our land. They created this whole document called Art History around their exploits. I felt that borrowing from their landscape paintings would be a way of reclaiming some of the land they had stolen from us. Monkman's monumental landscape, History is Painted by the Victors, revises Albert Bierstadt's Mount Corcoran. Whereas Mount Corcoran offers an open vista, an image of empty land available for the taking, Monkman's painting populates the land with human figures, some drawn from iconic landscape paintings and others that refer to historical events. At the center of the field of vision stands Miss Chief Eagle Testicle, Monkman's gender-fluid alter ego, so that the painting makes visible a presence on the land that is not only indigenous, but also queer. Within many indigenous societies, two-spirit people, typically those who adopted the social roles of the opposite gender or an alternative gender status, occupied prominent positions, including those of spiritual leadership, but colonial reformers aimed to eliminate two-spirit people and erase them from history. In Monkman's painting, Miss Chief appears prominently in front of an easel, paintbrush in hand, glancing slyly over her shoulder at the viewer and demanding that we see her. Her most obvious significance is that she renders visible a native presence on the land at the virtual entry point to the scene. Miss Chief, explains Monkman, was created to reverse the gaze, to counter the colonial spectator's visual appropriation of space as she looks back at European settlers. By undoing the socially empty space of conventional landscape and returning the gaze, Miss Chief redefines the land as a site of colonial encounter and offers an alternative visual narrative of Western expansion. In Monkman's painting, this visual narrative centers on the Plains Indian Wars. In 1876, as Bierstadt painted Mount Corcoran and the U.S. celebrated its centennial anniversary, the 7th Cavalry, led by George Armstrong Custer, met its demise at the hands of Sioux and Cheyenne warriors in the Battle of the Little Bighorn. The battle was part of the Great Sioux War, in which the U.S. seized the Black Hills, the area that now includes Mount Rushmore, even though the land had recently been guaranteed to the Sioux in the Treaty of Fort Laramie. The Sioux and Cheyenne victory made national headlines and threw into question the inevitability that progress, a notion closely tied to white racial superiority, would inevitably defeat Indian savagery. 
In Monkman's painting, the nude white men, their blue uniforms strewn across the ground, represent Custer's soldiers, and the image on Miss Chief's easel refers to a native account of the war. It is a pictograph from the ledger drawings compiled as The Battle of the Little Bighorn, an eyewitness account by the Lakota chief Red Horse. By focusing on a native victory in the Plains Indian Wars and calling attention to a native perspective, Monkman disrupts dominant understandings of history that make indigenous disappearance seem inevitable. And by calling attention to indigenous presence on the land, Monkman calls attention to the injustice of dispossession and provides crucial context for land conflicts in the present. Today, the territorial conflicts that continue across Native America encompass battles against extractive industry. In 2016, the construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline across Native lands prompted the largest indigenous resistance movement in recent history. Representatives from more than 300 tribal nations gathered at the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation, some staying for weeks or months in camps that sprang up to house them. As social media drew global attention to the tribe's battle against pipeline construction, many non-Native allies, including Hollywood celebrities, joined the cause and brought more public awareness to the conflict. In the broader population, many saw the dangers posed by the pipeline as primarily environmental in nature. Its nearly 1,200-mile proposed route crossed under the Missouri and Mississippi rivers, prompting fears that crude oil spillage would inevitably contaminate water for drinking and irrigation across a wide region. But for Native communities, the pipeline brought additional threats. Because its route extends across lands guaranteed to the Great Sioux Nation under the Treaty of Fort Laramie, the pipeline violates tribal sovereignty over ancestral lands, thereby extending a long history of dispossession and disempowerment that unites Native peoples across tribal boundaries. Beyond such political transgressions, the pipeline also breaches beliefs rooted in traditional indigenous epistemologies in the sacredness of land. Defend the sacred became a rallying cry that found expression, among other places, in the art that emerged from the movement. Art was a crucial part of the resistance in other ways as well. Artists sold their work to provide funding to support the water protectors in their months-long occupation. They also demanded public attention to police violence against the water protectors, violence that was neglected by mainstream media, and brought to light the histories that underlie Native claims to the site of the occupation. The police and National Guard responded to the Standing Rock movement with aggressive force that included tear gas, rubber bullets, and concussion grenades. In the midst of the bitterly cold South Dakota winter, police used water cannons on protesters in an event reminiscent of police use of fire hoses on African Americans during the Civil Rights era. Despite hundreds of reported injuries, some severe, mainstream media generally neglected these events, at least until significant numbers of non-Native people joined the protesters. Even then, news reports often insinuated that police violence was justified. Anishinaabe artist Jim Denomi made this violence the subject of paintings that featured mass force brought to bear on unarmed protesters. For Denomi, such brutality constitutes the latest episode in a long history of state violence against indigenous people. One painting, Wounded Knee 2016, connects the violence at Standing Rock to the 1890 Wounded Knee Massacre of 300 unarmed men, women, and children, the event that for historians often marks the end of the Plains Indian Wars. But Denomi's art presents contemporary violence against Native people as an extension of historical Indian wars. By embedding the protest against the Dakota Access Pipeline in history, Denomi represents the place's contested land and shows fights over it as ongoing. Bringing to light this history in turn supports Native territorial claims in the present. Shan Goshorn's Defending the Sacred a sculptural piece that features an image of the water protectors, 
invokes the ways that indigenous territorial rights are enshrined in U.S. law. The sculpture includes a picture of the signing of the 1868 Treaty of Fort Laramie, and it takes the form of a legal briefcase woven from strips embossed with the words of the treaty. Under the treaty, Goshorn's sculpture reminds us, the land belongs to the Sioux. The stories represented by Native artists, from Washington's military campaigns on the Haudenosaunee, to the Indian Wars on the Plains, to the conflicts at Standing Rock, represent a long, unbroken history of Native dispossession that commenced with Columbus and continues into the present. The Indian Wars have never ended in the Americas, writes novelist Leslie Mormon Silco. Whereas monuments such as Mount Rushmore silence this history to promote the idea of a free and just nation, the work of indigenous artists offers moments of visibility that puncture an abiding social invisibility, compelling us to see contemporary Native people and to understand the claims that they still hold to the land. Last July, Lehman Brightman, a Sioux activist and history professor, joined the protests of Trump's speech. Some people believe that the 4th of July signifies America's independence from the British, he says, but we actually lost over 1 billion acres of land, and every inch of this land in North America is stained with Indian blood. We're still fighting. I'm fighting the same fight that my ancestors fought. Unraveling the meanings of monuments calls upon us to reckon with the histories that brought the nation into being, the brutal consequences for indigenous communities across the Americas, and the meanings of these histories for U.S. national identity. Before we delve into the collective conversation, well, first I want to thank Sherry for that really incredibly powerful powerful intervention that we're going to spend time unpacking and talking about and hearing from you about. Um, Sherry asked that we give a little bit of background into the film to frame our discussion and her intervention into its contents. So bear with me for a moment while I, I share my screen. Okay, hopefully this is legible for folks. So uh, Save the Presidents is a film that Tali and I made in 2017. In its original form, it is a 13 minute experimental conceptual nonfiction work, but we've shown this piece in multiple contexts and each time we've tried to stretch its shape and possibilities. So the sites of exhibition have spanned film festivals to a transformation into a participatory sculpture for the Socrates Sculpture Park in Long Island City, to the screens of Times Square with Midnight Moment. And throughout these gestures, we aim to mutate these whole but cracking monuments into shape-shifting, unresolved counter monuments. Um, and for this current and ongoing chapter of the project, uh, we have thus far organized six collaborative events which unearths different oppressed historical narratives that are silenced by hegemonic foundational American mythology. So by continually mining and recontextualizing the film, we are creating space for counter narratives amidst the landscape of a counter monument artwork. In, a, in addition to a distinct narration, each iteration of the film is different in its length and pace and allows for visual interventions, which you have just seen an example of the layering of more images and uh, various forms of images that become part of the film. And now, um, Sherry, thank you for joining us. And the chat is also open for your questions. We would really want this to be, we're, we're gonna start a conversation, but we would love this to be a collective conversation. And we truly invite every possible question, comment, anything you, would like to add um, to the discussion. We couldn't be more thrilled and honored that Sherry agreed to collaborate with us in this endeavor. Um, and in many ways, Sherry's lecture speaks to the most fundamental fallacy of American ideology being, um, being one that is grounded in notions of freedom and democracy, 
which we know are so contradictory in nation in nature. We know that the that the United States was really founded by way of violence, by way of capture, erasure, and enslavement. And this iteration of the project in many ways feels distinct from other lecture performances that perhaps some folks on the call have attended um, in the past because it really speaks to the gaps in monumental history as it relates to monumental representation in the form of, of monuments. Um, and we were also really moved in by the ways in which Sherry approached the project by incorporating other artists work who we admire, including Alan Michelson and Kent Monkman and Jim Denomi and Shan Goshorn into the fabric of the work, um, kind of extending and expanding upon um, all different modes of representation to begin to kind of chip away at these monumental narratives. And we wanna, we wanna start our conversation by posing a question to you, Sherry, which is, can you talk a little bit about your process for intervening within the film? Yeah, first I wanna say thank you um, to Alex and Tally for the invitation, really a wonderful invitation and to the Goethe Institute for, um, for holding the event. Um, it's been so interesting working on this project and I'm just gonna say a little bit about how the film struck me when I first saw it. Um, but it's, it's just been an interesting, fun project and a real honor to work with the two of you. So thank you for the invitation. Um, so this invitation came um, at a time when I wasn't sure that I could take on the project. Um, but once I had seen part of this film, it became absolutely irresistible. And that was true for a lot of reasons. So one was just um, how striking I found the visual dimensions of the film. I'm just seeing those um, sculptures in that field and sort of the use of, use of light and time and so on it was so visually striking and it was almost surreal, right? Like those images. And I just kept wanting to look and look and, and think more about, um, about the images. But I was also struck by how um, the film so artfully invokes issues that are so pressing um, in this moment. So issues about the creation of national history and the sort of intense conflicts over national history that we see manifested most obviously in um, sometimes violent conflicts over monuments, right? So this was a really timely intervention that you made. But also um, all of the sort of questions and conflicts that um, bear, that emerge from those questions about national histories. And some of these questions have been explored in some of the prior um, the prior presentation. So questions about social power, race, gender, class, about the state violence that's brought to bear on society to keep those hierarchies in place. Um, so the film for me invoked those things, those things too. And it became very difficult to figure out what to focus on in a short period because there was so much. And Alex and Tally know that when I got the invitation, I was sort of going around and round about um, what to do because there were so many possibilities. But eventually I settled on this notion of national history and how it's represented in part because for me, those figures of the presidents are the primary way of kind of glorifying and disseminating um, a version of national history that from an indigenous perspective is very damaging, right? Um, so I wanted to think about the ways in which that version of history is by necessity premised on indigenous erasure, because if you think of the violence that was necessarily involved in creating the nation, you really undo that notion of the presidents as representing freedom, justice, democracy, um, and so on. So I wanted to think about that um, construction of history and how it was constructed and what's being erased in the process. But it was important to me not to leave it there. I also wanted to think about um, national history as a major theme of so many indigenous artists. I um, mean, you just got a sort of small snapshot of that in the images that I picked. These just amazing artists who were taking on this dominant notion of national history and not only taking apart, but offering alternative versions of history um, and considering what it means to actually acknowledge indigenous presence in that history. Um, and in so doing, they're shifting our perspectives 
on a collective history, but also, and I, I was trying to stress this as well, um, they're shifting how we think about social authority. Like who has the power to tell that history? Who should be narrating that history and why? Um, the final point that was really important to me to convey um, in my intervention was the notion that history isn't in the past, right? And I mean that in two senses. So one is that how we understand history bears on how we understand the present, but also the ways in which this history of dispossession isn't over. And that's why I wanted to end on the Standing Rock conflict and this wonderful quote by Leslie Marmon Selko that the Indian wars have never ended in the Americas. Because one thing we see in indigenous art and in conversations in native studies more broadly is this is part of continuous history that continues into the present. It didn't end in 1890, right? It, it's ongoing. And the way we think about what happened in the past really shapes our understandings of social justice in the present in the context of these ongoing conflicts. I have a couple of questions for you, if I may. Is that all right? Please, yes, yeah. Okay. I mean, it was really important to me um, that the conversation focused not just on my intervention, but also on the film, because this was truly a collaboration. I mean, what I wrote about was completely inspired by this amazing film. And then it was um, wonderful to me to see what you did with how you re edited the film to incorporate the images. And that's just another work of art in itself. So um, I really want to make sure that the conversation encompasses all of this work together. But I did want to raise a couple of things that struck me when I first watched the film. So one thing was the way in which you introduced temporality into the film. So when we think about monuments, you know, monuments are about history, they're about a moment in time, but they try to fix that moment in time to make it static, to make it enduring, um, to make it seem permanent. And it seemed really important to me that you um, kind of undid that idea by introducing time in two ways. So one was showing the monuments over the course of a day, right? Like this is sunrise to sunset, um, but also by showing the decomposition of the monuments. And that decomposition seemed to me a kind of invitation to think about the ways things are composed. And that was my starting point. So I wanted to ask you about time, but I also wanted to ask you about something that I didn't touch on at all in my narration, and that was the issue of labor, that the film really foregrounds um, labor. Um, and I wanted to know why you did that and what you were thinking about. Um, should I start? Start and um, I can add on. Okay, so uh, thank you, Sherry. And yes, I think it's really important to, to mention how this is a collaborative work, not just between Alex and myself, but between us. And like for us, there just for people under so people would understand the process. We we gave you the film, and then we said like whatever you want to bring back to us, just give us. And and for us, it's also that kind of surprise of like how are we going to re-edit this? How are we going to incorporate uh, the, these images into the films? What what are the conceptual uh, decisions we'll have to make? And we were also so happy and, and thrilled that you included other artists, uh, invited other artists into this. Um, so just to kind of put that into, into context of how, how this version of the film came to be. And that's also maybe connecting us to labor and to construction and deconstruction. And, and I think uh, something that happened when Alex and I arrived uh, to the place, it's in, in Virginia, um, it's on private property, and we realized that on this, um, on this, place, that in this place, there are a lot of things that are happening. Like we've seen these images in the newspaper clips. They're always kind of these, you know, eerie, weird, like almost sci-fi figures. And then we got there, and it's a work site, and people are actually working there, and they're, you know, doing a lot of manual labor, like chopping wood, because building roads. And we felt like if we think about these as infrastructures almost, if, if this site is a metaphor for infrastructure, this is how it's being composed, right? This is how it's being built. And if we kind of go further with the metaphor, it's also a place where we see how, how Fred, how like actually these things are, we can penetrate, like we can see their cracks, we can see their decomposition. They're not God given, you know, not to use like God as, as just as a metaphor, but they're not, 
they are, they're not stable. Like we can, they are stable, but we want to destabilize them. So I think going into these cracks became also a way to kind of penetrate and say like, how can we enter this? How can we look at this power and, and question it? This, you know, power, this history of settler colonialism. And lastly, the thinking about maybe the course of a day, it's also, you know, this kind of cyclical time. There's something about both time as eternal, ongoing, but also an opportunity for change, an opportunity maybe also to think of things, you know, kind of growing and dying. So there's something about also nature and uh, decomposition uh, that has that's kind of penetrated into this kind of I don't know, it's almost, it's hard for me to, maybe Alex, you can say more about that, about like the, the course of the day and, and about time and those, and light as well, I think, has, was a very strong um, uh, kind of key element we worked with. Yeah, I mean, I think that that was just a way of also speaking to thinking about these cycles of power. Um, and uh, I'll, I can get into that in a moment, but wait, wait, I want to just add to what you've already said, which is, in focusing on these monuments as cracked, we wanted to kind of point to the fact that they've always been cracked. They're not whole. And they are so often perceived as whole or even perceived as, as wallpaper. Rosalind mm. Deutsch talks about monuments as, um, as kind of instruments for forgetting. Because when you move through space and you see a monument, like very rarely do you actually stop and look at what's being memorialized. So they almost become naturalized within the landscape, the way in which these monumental narratives become naturalized, become accepted um, in the way in which they're taught and passed down and kind of repeated. And so by, by showing these very familiar subjects as cracked, vulnerable, penetrable, we wanted to reveal or kind of point to the fact that they always are this. Um, and in some ways it's interesting what a spectacle they have become like this particular site. And I can also attend to one of the, the questions in the chat, which from Joshi um, asked uh, where these monuments actually are situated. Um, and how they came to be in the state of disrepair. So the, this field of monuments, as Tali mentioned, is a, a private work site um, in rural Virginia. And the monuments themselves had initially belonged to a outdoor sculpture park. And the sculpture park closed in the wake of the economic crisis in 2010. And they were moved piece by piece um, by this kind of nationalist builder um, who has all this, this fantasy of restoring them. Um, and uh, it, it's, um, it's interesting in, in, in just thinking about how, um, how in, in focusing, I'm sorry, I'm getting very distracted because we keep having questions coming in from the chat. So I'm, I've lost my trail of thought on what I was going to say there. So forgive me. Um, but what I wanted to point to is that in kind of showing these monuments as as cracked, we wanted to just point to the fact that they've always been been cracked. Um, they always are cracked. And in focusing on on labor, we also wanted to tease out the relationship between um, kind of capitalist exploitation as it relates to um, this kind of whole image of um, American ideology or even uh, by way of kind of American um, aspirationalism, that there always is exploitation in the process of producing that image, but also in enacting that reality and who gets to actually enact it. Um, and as, as, as we've been talking about, these, these monuments have been captured quite a bit. And when Tali and I first went out to film in 2016, they were slightly more um, uh, obscure, but they've now become much more in the mainstream. And we were interested in how in all of the, the representation of these objects, the labor is never pointed to, it continues to be erased. So we wanted to kind of tease out and shed light on the hidden labor that even lives within, within this site. And maybe just one more thing to say about the labor. I think what we're also trying to see to show is the construction of the image in some ways, kind of, mm. again, if we're thinking about this as an infrastructure, 
um, these things are being, they're not, they're, I mean, you gave that quote of power being most effective when it's transparent. So there's something about showing the labor of construction into power that provides an avenue for conversations about how power is being constructed, manifested, and who it impacts and who it, you know, where, where it kind of takes its claws uh, to, again, use a very kind of, I'm very using big metaphors today, but, um, but yeah, how it basically, it's, it's to how it operates. So something about this kind of labor adjacent to the monument, to the crack monument kind of, for us again, gives an opportunity to, to look at, at the infrastructure of power and not just as a obsolete. Well, I, I know we have to turn to the questions, but just as um, somebody watching the film, that issue of labor was, so it was really interesting to hear your answers. Thank you for that. Um, the, the issue of labor was resonant for me in so many other ways too, that you, know, you just didn't happen to mention, but you know, the history of labor in building the United States, like slavery, right? Which is an issue that's been discussed in some of the previous events, but also the kind of conflict surrounding labor in this moment of late capitalism. Right, that are really bound up with the monumentalization of history. So it's just, I'm stuck on it because it was one of the many things in your film that was so resonant. Absolutely, and even just the scale of who gets remembered. I mean, I think we were really struck by seeing like the human scale in relationship to the monuments when we were even filming on site. Like even if Tali was with a camera somewhere across the way in the field, she was just minuscule in comparison to them or seeing the different people kind of, um, cultivating mulch or working on landscape or even driving trucks like this the scale of the human form and the the vulnerability of the human form was so apparent in comparison to these kind of over the top albeit cracked and decaying monuments mm -hmm. so it also just kind of begs the question of whose stories do we remember um and and who gets memorialized even in the you know the, the context of thinking about labor um and class yeah. But a question that we have for you, Sherry, that we want to pose, and then we can, and then we are, we can turn more directly to the chat. And apologies that we haven't attended to some of the questions yet, and we hope that you'll continue to, to share them. Um, institutions have been have been really quick to adopt land acknowledgement acknowledgements as of late. Mm -hmm. This is something we've we've talked about a little bit um, outside of this kind of formal presentation. And a question that we have that I know a lot of um, people are grappling with is what would it mean for an institution to actually meaningfully address the history of settler colonial violence and erasure against indigenous popula populations that institutions have really benefited from um, beyond kind of the linguistic gesture of a land acknowledgement beyond just saying, you know, I stole this, now let's move on to the events. Like there's something in that that also can be really crass if it's not if it's not actually manifested in something that is material, that's something that has kind of like redistribution strategy embedded within it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, yeah, you know, I'm thinking of something like Tuck and Yang's essay, Decolonization is not a metaphor. Um, but I'm wondering what your thoughts are. Um, specifically, you know, we've been looking at uh, different artworks throughout the course of, of this talk and your, your intervention. Like, what does it mean for a collecting institution like the Met that owns lots of Native American artifacts and artwork to have a land acknowledgement, but to not reconsider their ownership over the objects that they have on view and how that adds to their wealth as an institution? So I really appreciate that question in part because of its timeliness, right? It's something that's so much part of the general conversation now and the conversation in all of our institutions, including the institution I occupy. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but the other thing I appreciate is that um, your question really acknowledges that um, acknowledgements can't be an end in themselves, right? So acknowledgements have become really important in recent years starting in Canada, I mean, more before the United States, um, as a means to um, recognize, I'm, I'm, I keep going back to one of the quotes that um, I ended my narration with, and that is that um, 
every inch of this land is soaked in Indian blood. We're all on native land, right? Um, so the importance of not acknowledging that and also asking the question of how it came to be either no longer native land or land that's no longer controlled by the native people who have rights to it. So land acknowledgements were a way of addressing that problem, but they've become controversial um, precisely because of the problem that you've identified. And that is that they come to be seen as an end in themselves, right? So I've made this acknowledgement and I've done my part, now let's go on, right? Um, really what our conversation needs to be is what obligations emerge from acknowledging that you're occupying someone else's territory? And that's a question that's relevant for all of us. So my community is in Alaska. I'm on someone else's land. I'm on Ohlone land. And so that's a question that I have to grapple with even as a native person in someone else's territory. So what are my personal obligations? Um, that's an obligation I might think about in multiple ways, including an obligation to the community here, right? How do I participate? How do I contribute? Um, I might think about that in curricular terms, like, you know, I need to include material from here in my teaching. I might feel a particular obligation to Native California students whom I work with, right? So those might be some of the ways I might think about um, that obligation. Now thinking about institutions, and I mean, we can come back to the Met in a second. Um, my head right now is an educational institution. So the University of California at Berkeley, among many institutions is a land grant institution or as some people call it a land grab institution. So what that means is that the University of California at Berkeley um, gained part of its land through the Morrill Act, which was passed in the 1860s, which took so-called public lands and gave them to educational institutions, either you know, to be founded or to increase their holdings and therefore increase their educational possibilities. So those so-called public lands were native lands, right? They're taken from native communities and then given to universities. So what is the obligation of an institution that's built on native land, right? Somebody else's land. Um, and, you know, we might think about that as like, maybe our native students shouldn't pay tuition. Maybe we should get back part of that land. Maybe we should acknowledge that on our campus, there's a sacred site and maybe the native people from this place should control that site. Maybe we have obligations with regard to admission, um, recruitment, to financial support, to other forms of support, to students from here. And also we have an obligation to create a relationship with, you know, those people are still here. Ohlone people are still here, right? Like we as an institution have an obligation to create a relationship and hear from them about what they need from us. So that's how I would think about an obligation in an in educational institution setting. The Met's another setting. Um, is it okay if I sort of bounce that question back to you as artists who are people in the art world and what you think that might look like in an art institution setting? I mean, I'm very personally invested in thinking about redistribution and, and uh, think and um, like, I don't think the Met should own any of that on any of the, the artifacts or artworks that were either um, either purchased in a way that was unjust or, um, or stolen. I, I, it's, it's hard for me to think of, a, of a, how this can, how, how there can be any genuine attempt at reconciliation um, in any way, and I'm even kind of reluctant to use that term because I don't think it's possible um, in a like in a concrete sense. But how do you begin to address or account for um, the role of the institution? And I think it's by way of something that is monetary and material. And I don't think it rests solely in language. Um, yeah. and I think that's true with with most aspects of of the art world. I mean. How long do you have? I could talk about this all day in terms of thinking about the art world, but, but Tali, what were you going to say? No, I think that these things, um, I mean, it's about giving up privileges and things that have, you know, 
been historic, and I can also talk about this from, you know, where I'm from. I'm also from a country that personally is founded in similar ways. I'm from Israel, and of course, we it's hard for me to have this conversation and not bring Palestine into it. And I think about it constantly in ways of what do you, what do you bring back? How you can take back time. That's just not going to happen, but you have to let go. You have to let go of fictions that have become your, you have to let go of something internal, like the process of decolonization. That's first of all, something that is mental and then it's and it's all and then it's also and it's also material like it's both language it's both psyche but it, it's and then it has to go into practice and what and yes redistribution and giving back and then also reimagining institutions i think like reimagining shared um a place not yeah reimagining um how how you know how shared collectives um societies can live be after. So I don't think it's necessarily reconciliation. Of course, South Africa is like a very complicated example of, but also um, I think that it's it's an on, it's a very, um, it's a very important and like, and I, I don't know if there's just like one thing to say, because I also think that that's a little bit um, easy in some ways to say, yeah, like, Yes, there has to be, there has to be letting go. There has to be redistribution, but there has to be continual work of education, of, of storytelling. And again, that's why in, in many ways art has, I believe also has a role in, in reshaping or not, you know, kind of has a role in, in telling stories, but also in telling how the stories we think are truths are in fact, many of them are fictions. And maybe there's just that part of the process of, of that could help us rethink about how future institutions should look like, both governing, cultural, educational. Um, it's like a foundational, it, there has to be a foundational change and it's long and it's a process. And I think like maybe this is also a moment to turn to the audience, to the chat um, yeah, well, some, as you were speaking just now, we're, first of all, honored that Alan Michelson is, is watching um, the artist whose work you saw recently, and, and he said one place to start is honor the treaties. And I wonder, Sherry, how you would respond to that. Yeah, absolutely. And when we think about Standing Rock, and I see a little bit of the chat, you know, when someone asked about, you know, the money, right, like there's this money and trust, and why is it still there? And why isn't it benefiting Native communities um, who've been dispossessed? And the reason is they think the land isn't for sale. They want the land. It's their land. They want the land. They don't want the money. And honoring the treaties means acknowledging that, that the land is theirs, right, by treaty. Um, that's a good place to start. I, you know, I do think, and I'm speaking from a particular perspective here, as somebody come, who comes from a place with no treaties, right? That we can't stop there because not all native communities have treaties and we can't limit um, our acknowledgement of land rights to lands that are um, acknowledged in the treaties, right? So, you know, one basis for native land rights is historical use and occupancy. Like that conveys a legal right to the land. So yes, absolutely, we need to acknowledge treaties, but we also need to acknowledge those histories on the land that convey legal rights in the present. And you know, in the place where I'm from, you know, a major issue is um, native communities that depend on hunting and fishing. And you know, those rights are being um, um, not acknowledged in ways that mean that you know, sometimes people can't eat, right? So that's another thing to do. They don't have a treaty. We don't have treaties there, but they do have a right to do those things. So I, I, take, I think that's a great point. I would just broaden a bit by just saying acknowledge native land rights um, within and beyond treaties. And what an honor that Alan Michelson is there. Yes, <laughs> Thank we you. are. There's a yeah. question from Rotem that I'll read aloud. Um, they write, can you speak about your methodology and your approach to the artworks? More specifically, I'm wondering how art history itself and its methodologies are implicated in a long history of colonialist violence and native erasure. 
And what ways might we develop new ways of looking and new decolonial tools for talking about and speaking around art generally, and specifically art that itself seeks to expand and challenge a Western canon, like those of the artists you included in your intervention? Sorry, I'm reading the question. So that seems like it's for all of us. Does anyone want to? I am not an art historian, <laughs> and I will acknowledge that from the beginning. And anyone who is an art historian will recognize immediately that I'm not. Um, you know, I'll be interested to see what the two of you have to say about this as artists. But you know, one thing I know about art history, and this is partly from some just amazing graduate students I have here at Berkeley who come from art history is that it's been one of the disciplines that's been slower, um, slower to really diversify in any, to occupy the world that we all occupy, right? And to ask questions about politics, right? So, you know, landscape genre in the 19th century, like, you know, a typical art history question isn't like, well, what is that landscape obscuring? And what do those landscape, what political functions do those landscape paintings serve? That's not an art history question. So I'm having a little bit of a hard time answering the question because I feel like I'm, I'm um, really outside of art history and looking at art from a lens that's not art historical. That's asking questions mm -hmm. about construction, about politics and so on. That might be a really good place yeah, that's to approach art history. Yeah, it's that's what not being entrenched in that canon. But Tali, what were you going to say? No, that I think both of us are we're not art historians as well. We're artists. And in many ways, when we think of art history or when we think about pedagogy or when we think about, you know, what we're what what we want to make, um, we are trying to, to think how to undo these canons and um, in many not to sound again too to, or, uh, or even how not to be complicit to, to even say, or even just be aware and constantly question ourselves. Uh, and I can say it's when you like teaching, that's like something obviously you, you wanna, you wanna be the most, um, you don't wanna repeat the same kind of like Western canon to your students. Um, that's not the world you want them to see. That's not the world. Um, so, it's just like, again, I think both as educators and as artists, um, we're doing our best to question these systems and to really think about, and, and maybe to go back to, to the previous question about how, how like something, how redistribution of resources, of knowledge, of space can actually look like, who gets to be represented and who gets to speak and who gets, to be shown and all these things are things we're constantly, Alex and I and many artists are occupied with. And that's also part of the reason we're doing this event and why we're even thinking of working together with many people because it is about opening space. It's not about closing. It's not about repetition of these, of this like violence of erasure. It's on the contrary, it's pointing to it and thinking of how, how can we kind of just start to do this, you know, kind of, see things. Well, that's kind of interesting too, to think about what are the implications of disrupting the canon or broadening the canon or whatever. And I'm kind of stuck on the question about the Met, right? And thinking about the Met and the way that art in general signifies and how what art means in society has been so bound up with the social hierarchies that we've been talking about. So when we think historically about racialized histories within and beyond the United States, like it's civilized people who have art, right? And art is this sort of um, manifestation of the civilization of European people, right? Or people of European origin. And it really shows the supposed inferiority of all those other people who we decide don't have real art, right? So what does it mean to decide that Native art is really art and it's really good art. So, you know, Kent Monkman's painting is now, you know, was commissioned for the Great Hall. And that's meaningful in more than symbolic terms, right? Um, so I think, you know, diversifying the canon has really material implications for thinking about hierarchies in society, material hierarchies in society. Um, just to kind of point, I just wanna, cause there was a comment uh, by Adam 
earlier uh, because we we got and Alex, um, you will. Uh, I know you want to read. I see that you want to respond, but I just want to give space for Adam's comment. He said, "I love the addition of Kent Monkman, Monkman's work, which also seemed to have an interesting relationship to time, a reclaiming of time, sometimes anachronistic, driving a focus back to the stories we tell and the stories and the histories we claim." So just because you brought that up, I also. Um, I wonder too, Sherry, um, a question for you about your intervention, because we all we had folks wondering if the sculptures were adjacent to Mount Rushmore. I mean, obviously there is this kind of visual parallel between what the the monuments fig, uh, featured in the film, and um, and you know those uh, pictured on on Mount Rushmore. What what drew you to Mount Rushmore as a kind of framing device for your intervention? You know, I think it was, um, there were a couple of things. So one was like, okay, here are the same figures, right? But, you know, the side of Mount Rushmore was a way for me to make very material that connection between representation and land conflicts, right? So Mount Rushmore, where the presidents are carved into this space, that is an act itself of dispossession and disrespect, right? And so I, you know, I could have made the case for any forms, you know, of um, any manifestations of figures of the president, presidents, but the fact that Mount Rushmore is on land that everyone acknowledges to be native land, whether or not they want to give it back is another thing was a way for me to, to bring in the issue of land conflicts in a more direct way. And also, so there was that. And then there was also that grotesque Trump speech that got so much um, attention recently, the speech I quoted from in July. And so it's, it's also part of the current conversation. So that was the other thing. I, I'm thinking again, I'm, I'm also still with the myth question um, as a museum educator. And I all, I'm with two questions. I'm one with uh, the, what do you do with the museum? And the second is, let's start giving back and how would that look like globally? And, and what does the practicality of this all look like? And what are the stages? I think there's something, um, there's something that I sense that there's something about the intellectual process that needs to happen in some ways. And that's why I'm, I'm going back to the Met for a second. And then the practical, po like politics, policy, institutional activism, all these are like kind of two processes that are, I, I kind of see in, in my mind kind of going and, and thinking where I stand as an artist and as an educator. And also as someone who works in museum education, I didn't work, I haven't worked at the Met uh, and I haven't worked in a museum that has, um, you know, stolen, I mean, I, I worked at MoMA, I, I don't know what, I, in terms of modern art collections they have, I'm not as, you know, I'm, I don't wanna speak to their collection because I don't know it that well, maybe they do have stolen artifacts, but, um, but, I think that in some ways there's something as an educator inside a museum that you probably want to bring that up immediately with with people that come in. Like, this, should this be in the museum? What do you think? Where and how and if and and then like kind of you know bring that conversation as as a first step even with students, and then. I don't know, I think those are, are even like small steps so that's just like an individual and as an educator, I'm thinking about like if I was to work in an institution like that, um, that should be just, and I don't know, that just should should be an immediate part of, of a conversation. Like you would speak about Picasso as you know, what in his relationship to women at MoMA immediately, like that's, those things are just, I mean, they're there. And of course we can kind of tear down Picasso and throw it, but like also what should we do, you know, as people who work in these institutions, in academia, in museums? Yeah, I mean, there, there are just endless contradictions. Um, I have been in a, I'm a, I'm a teacher at RISD and I've been part of a group of faculty this semester um, where we have been meeting all semester um, to think about what it would mean to decolonize RISD, 
this private school that students uh, have to pay so much money to attend on stolen land. And it's just, it's, there are just endless contradictions to work through, endless fallacies. And it's, it's, it's a continual labor that um, I think can start and needs to rest in conversation, but also has to have something that is more tangible attached to it. And so Sherry, I appreciated what you were saying earlier and thinking about Berkeley, like holding the school accountable to actually allow for free tuition or to, or to give up certain parts of the space itself. Because I think that there's also this, something I'm noticing that so many institutions, educational, art, artistic, and otherwise are kind of um, wanting to let everything live in the metaphoric, kind of stay in the, in the realm of the conversation and not actually give anything up. But those conversations don't mean that much if they don't lead to something that is actionable, something that tangibly affects bodies and lives. Um, and I, I can't think of that many institutions at this moment in time that I think are, are model institutions in really, in really addressing these issues. And I hope that that changes. Um, and it, it's, a, it's, we're nearing the end. Um, and I don't mean to end on such a grim note, but if anyone has any other comments or, um, or, ideas or um, even want to disagree with some of what we've been talking about, like we really welcome um, using this as a space to kind of think through these ideas together. Um, Alex, but, can I just add a couple things to what you just said, just because yeah. I think, you know, as we're wrapping up a couple things I would like to drop in. So thinking about giving back, there's an interesting um, movement now, the land back movement. And if anyone's interested in that, a good site to look at is the Indian Collective, which is NDN Collective, to think about like what that looks like across Native America. But also thinking about um, art in, or museums as institutions giving back. This is a big story, but um, I'm gonna make it you know, very um, succinct. And that is that a major issue for Native people now is all the um, ancestors, the bones that are held by museums you know, colonization has been um, an exercise in acquisitiveness, not just of land, but also of bodies. And there are tens of thousands of, of native bones in um, US museums. And um, I'm on two re repatriation committees, one at the Hearst Museum here at Berkeley and another at the National Museum of the American Indian. And that's an ongoing project of returning those bones. I mean, it's something that's very meaningful to native communities um, and another sort of, um, really awful history which museums are bound up in. Thank you for mentioning that. And it, it feeds into a question that, um, that we just got from Alex in the audience who writes, how could the Capitol Rotunda be reimagined as a public space to reflect the true history of the US? It's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting proposal. Sherry, what are your thoughts? Well, okay, so um, there is actually a conversation now that's going on about that officially in the Capitol. We'll see how far it goes. Um, you know, people have different ways of approaching this issue. Some just want to reframe or give more information. My own answer is like those um, paintings have to come down and different ones have to go up. I don't think that will happen, but that would be my, that would be what I would say. Um, but I also wonder about you two as artists, what you would say about that. Yeah, I think that's in some ways that's that's the work, like the work is to get to that place where that's the giving back, that's the tangible, that's the actual action. And if someone goes to a space like that and that's what they how they see themselves being represented, that's that something that just has to go and it might go down. It just needs to, you know, uh, monuments have been taken down and these things are racist, so they should be taken down. I mean, that would be my my straight answer. I mean, and I think then the question is, take it down and let it be empty and let there be a kind of like wrestling with the emptiness and the problematics of what has, has rested there for so long. But I also think there could be, there's something to thinking about kind of the, 
logic or language of a counter monument and how that could then be applied to that setting. So mm -hmm. thinking about counter monuments as um, interruptions into the status quo is something that is temporal, is something that it, you know, is ephemeral that can fade or change over time, um, that does not have one kind of singular viewpoint, but is porous and allows for multiple entry points that might follow a kind of logic um, that speaks to also the limits of our knowledge about things that are not our own embodied or lived experiences or even experiences that have happened before the time in which we have kind of inhabited the planet. I'm thinking about someone even like Cydia Hartman, the, the historian and her really brilliant work into thinking about the gaps into archives and um, her willingness to kind of say, I don't know. I think that whatever is, it would be there should reflect on a kind of um, unthinking of mastery um, so that we even begin to rethink about representational history um, and, and recognize that true representation in and of itself is a kind of impossibility. And it's not necessarily an impossibility that one should never you know, work for or try to, um, uh, manifest, but that those gaps should be accounted for. And at the same time, I also think that these, um, that in some ways, I mean, we can talk about, you know, a post nation state situation, and then these questions would just become even, even bigger. But uh, until we, we kind of think in those ways as communities, people form around images and around representation. So um, the question of imagery and representation is such an important one because we need those as collectives. We need those to, to we need those to to reflect and we need those to see think to see ourselves and to see others and to imagine. And um, and that's also a really exciting place to imagine and to think and all, and to give space for for new things. And maybe also, you know, there's a possibility to imagine in something that is not constant something that is constantly changing because we don't even know how we should live as a society because as a society we might want to continually question the forms that we live in and and question ourselves kind of like checks and balances um so there there yeah i was just going to add that i think it's a question that i that that it's hard to answer as an individual person. Yeah. And that even speaks to the project then. Like it would have to be one that is collective and co continuously changing in terms of, of, of who's being listened to and who's being invited to participate. And that would have to be built into a structure. And maybe there's even a method of redistribution that's built into the structure. Um, maybe there are ways in which to redistribute funds by way of who, who gets exhibited or um, how the work kind of moves. Um, there's maybe we have time for one final question um, and thanks to everyone who's, who's stayed with us. Um, but Rose in the audience asks, I think a really great question that um, I'd be interested to hear your answer, Sherry, as, as a scholar and an academic and a professor, um, Rose writes parallel to the conversation about museums like the Met are there ways in which institutions such as libraries or archives can make space for untold histories, or maybe more specifically histories that are interpreted by institutions and information repositories in ways that are disingenuous or wrong? In the last part, I was thinking about the standing park treaty misinterpretation. Yeah, that is such a great history, a uh, great question that applies to so many um, situations. And I think, um, Alex, you just alluded to a really good answer, and that is that the beginning point for any kind of change in collections or representation or whatever is to change who's sitting around the table making the decisions, right? And so that's the first step is, you know, to gather people together who can make decisions collectively to, that are more um, equitable. And I was also, the question also took my mind back to a quote that I included in my um, narration. And that is the sort of acknowledgement that um, history is the fruit of power, right? So the collections that we have, um, you know, are the products of the social hierarchies that we have in place, right? And so to acknowledge that and to think about them critically is another 
and I think that's where the question is coming from, is another sort of starting place to think about how we might um, how we might begin reform. And that, you know, a place to collections and a place to museums and a place to curricula, um, to all these sort of situations in which we work. Walter Benjamin, not to, I'm quoting Walter <laughs> Benjamin, forgive me, but it feels relevant. I'm thinking about how in Theses on the Philosophy of History, he writes, there is no document of culture that is not also a document of barbarism. Yeah. So how do we, be, how do cult, collecting institutions institutions that are these cultural institutions, how do they reflect that in, in what they're showing? How does that become yeah. you know, more part of the conversation? Um, and I think that certainly would have to happen in the Capitol building. Um, and I think you're so right that it depends, it, I wouldn't want there to just be then a you know, committee of, of Washington uh, politicians then deciding who, whose work goes up in the Capitol. It would have the whole structure has to be rethought. Um, well, we have to acknowledge the, the sort of profound investment in these histories, right? And um, just to make a really long story short, re short, remember what happened the last time the Smithsonian tried to change, um, launched a sort of revisionist exhibition and that was in the 90s. It's a museum of, um, a National Museum of Natural History and Congress threatened to pull funding from the museum because it was un-American. So I, you know, we'll see what happens now with Art of the Capitol, I, you know, what the possibilities are. And I think on that, um, we, we can leave the conversation um, for now, unless there are any final comments from, uh, from you, Sherry, or from you, Tali. I just, uh, um, I wanna thank Sherry for, for, you know, for being so generous with us and for providing us the space to even engage in these conversations uh, with you and, and with everyone here. And um, I think that like, I, I have, you know, as someone who's also, I, I live in the States, but I'm also not from the States. I think these are really global. Like I, I also think about these as global questions and as like, and that's something that I think is really crucial. Like at this moment to not to think about these how they apply to Israel Palestine how they apply to other places um, you know um, like Canada I mean many many other places and I think the strength of this is that these are not just U.S. centered also I mean this is a very much U.S. centered story but it it's a European one and it's mm -hmm. one of you know of, of in, the enlightenment and we are still living this story and we are still living this violence. And I think that there's something um, that I also, I personally also think how this can go, how can we also give this, how can we work together across, across states, across nations uh, to, to kind of create this, this language and bring this into practice and kind of take from this model in one place and implement it in another into action because these things are, you know, they're impacting one another. So I, I'm, I'm inspired in those ways and I, on the personal, in the personal level to, to have these conversations. Yeah, so I mean, you. there are many other countries that have led the way in, in taking down monuments and being more specific about what we actually see and don't see in public space um, in terms of monumental representation. And it is such a kind of constant struggle and a transnational one, but, I think Sherry, ending the series with, with you is just so powerful on many levels and meaningful on many levels. Um, Tali and I were really reticent to be in conversation with Sherry because we, we were, we, and she really pulled it out. She said, no, we need to spend some time talking about your work as well. And I just wanna thank you for being so generous and being a true collaborator with us every step of the process. Um, it's been just, a complete honor to, to work with you and to learn from you. And um, we, we want to thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, well, just to thank you again. I mean, this really has been my honor and pleasure. This was such, a, um, such an interesting conversation and I'm grateful for the invitation. And I also want to say thank you to our amazing interpreters. Yes. Um, and also to our panel, I mean, to our, sorry, to our audience who asked such great questions, um, questions that I'm going to be thinking about for a long time. And also just for taking the time, you know, this is a difficult time and 
um, you know, devoting time on a Saturday afternoon or evening, whatever your time zone is, um, that is really meaningful. So thanks to all. Thank yes. Um, so with that, I will formally wrap by saying thank you, Sarika, Mita, and Hercules Gross Kewen, our wonderful interpreters. Um, thank you so much to Tuto Dirkak Somo, who helped produce the whole series um, and help run all of the technical side of things. It's very hard to play video over Zoom, and somehow it worked um, every time. So thank you, Tuto. And thank you so much to everyone at the Goethe Institute for supporting these conversations and for making space for them. Um, particularly, we want to thank Denise Sertkol and George Schumacher. This fall iteration of the series is going to be archived on the Goethe Institute's website, where you can also find the collaborations that we did earlier in the fall with Alex Espitale, the sociologist and historian Nikhil Paul Singh, and our most recent collaboration with education scholar Noliwe Rooks and student activist Whitney Stevenson. And documentation of this event that you all watched will be on our website shortly. So please feel free to, to share it or return to it. Um, and we're, we're grateful for your support. So thank you everybody and take Thanks care. Everyone.